signal to you when you are to rise and remain standing until all members of the stage party are seated. Music for this procession will be played by QCGU Brass Ensemble, consisting of Mark Bremner, trumpet, William Eager, trumpet, Robert McMillan, horn, Mark Young, trombone, and Scott Frankham, tuba. The processional music is Two Airs for Cornets and Sackbutts by Adson. Ms. Susanna Conway, Professor Roy Webb, Vice-Chancellor of Griffith University, members of the Griffith University Council, distinguished guests, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Council of the University, I extend a very warm welcome to everyone present for this graduation ceremony this evening. It has always been the custom for Griffith University and its guests to gather to celebrate the conferral of academic awards on its graduates. These occasions hold special significance for the graduates, for their families and for their friends and of course for the entire university community. In whatever capacity you are here this evening, you are most welcome. I extend a special welcome to Susanna Conway, Executive Director of the Centenary of Federation Queensland. She is our guest speaker and will address us later in the proceedings. In the life of the university, graduations are frequently recurring events. 
but their importance never diminishes and they never become simply routine. Each ceremony is unique in its public acknowledgement and its reward for each graduating student and their efforts and their hard work. The honour that we do them reflects as well on the university, the creative mould from which their achievement springs. Griffith University is renowned for its innovation and interdisciplinary approach to higher education and its breadth and diversity. It is committed to excellence, not only in the development of academic programs, but also in the pursuit of new knowledge and in placing the university's considerable cultural and intellectual resources at the service of the wider community. Griffith is ideally positioned in what is the fastest growing region in Australia. From its campuses here at South Bank, in the cultural heart of Brisbane, and soon to be joined by the Queensland College of Art, and its campuses at Nathan, Mount Gravatt, and through to Logan and the Gold Coast. Griffith caters for the higher education and research needs of those areas. Griffith University currently hosts 23,000 students, including the largest international student body in Queensland. Griffith has many achievements, including winning a Premier of Queensland's Award for Export Excellence. Those achievements attest to the success of the university's efforts to realise its vision to be a leading multi-campus, learner-centred research institution and the university of choice for the 21st century. The Queensland Conservatorium has been an important contributor to Griffith's successes and to the success of music in the state of Queensland. And tonight, as is only fitting, we honour its graduates. The South Bank redevelopment is nearing completion and has resulted in many changes to the Conservatorium building and its access. You will have all noticed the large staircase on the new entry this has necessitated several internal changes to the foyer of the building as well as the relocation of the co-op bookshop to its new premises on the river side of the building. Cafe Allegro, operated by South Bank Catering, has also been expanded to better service the large user population of Griffiths' central Brisbane location. The Conservatorium continues to be an active participant in Brisbane's cultural life. With funding from South Bank Corporation, the CON presented several exciting projects in the South Bank precinct, including the Latin band Hot Mambo, a percussion group called the Construction Workers, who I understand performed last night at the College of Art graduation, and a semi-staged open-air performance of the opera Giannini Chitilli. It's very successful live at the library program pioneered in 1999 will continue into the future with financial support from the Brisbane City Council through the Brisbane City Entertainment Program. The orchestral training program welcomed its new resident conductor, Mr. Michael Morgan, and continues to develop in collaboration with the Queensland Symphony Orchestra and the Queensland Philharmonic Orchestra. The Conservatorium Symphony Orchestra was honoured to perform the Great Bruckner, under the Great Bruckner Exponent and Honorary Doctor of the University, Conductor George Tintner. We are all saddened that it was one of his last performances. Mr Tintner died in November. The Conservatorium co-presented with the Queensland Performing Arts Trust and Opera Queensland, handles opera Agrippina as part of the Stage X Festival. The production was staged in the form of a television soap opera and featured students of the Conservatorium and Opera Queensland's Young Artists with an orchestra provided by the Conservatorium. It was directed by well-known opera personality Lindy Hume. Australia's first Bachelor of Popular Music has generated exceptional interest from school leavers. Its first enrolment 
of 20 students received tuition from prominent industry people, including Brian Cadd and Kevin Stanton, formerly of the band My Sex, and guest lecturers by prominent popular music musicologists such as Dr. Philip Tagg of the Institute of Popular Music at the University of Liverpool. The program will be moving into its new purpose-built facility at Griffith University's Gold Coast campus in mid-year 2000. One of our graduates tonight, Cathy Noonan, her brother, fellow conservatorium graduate Tyrone, and their band George came second in the Hard Rock Cafe's breeding ground competition for new bands in Melbourne in September, winning $5,000 in prizes. They released their second EP in November, You Can't Take What's Mine, which is currently receiving high rotation airplay on Triple J and 4ZZZ and has started charting in the national areas. The Young Conservatorium Choral Program at Southbank Campus now stretches from birth to 17 years with a thriving early childhood program and a total enrolment of over 600. There are now two Young Conservatorium choirs on the Gold Coast with a total enrolment of about 80 students. It is anticipated that the Gold Coast Choral Program will continue to expand into 2001 and will include an early childhood music program. Individually, our students and our graduates have achieved high honour. Pianist Liam Viney was one of the six entrants from around the world to be accepted by Yale University, while fellow pianist Chiang Wen Chang made his concert debut at Carnegie Hall. Pianist Ai Bin Ho was accepted into the master's program at Bloomington, Indiana, and Teresa Bricks was accepted on a full postgraduate scholarship into the Royal Academy of Music in London. Soprano, soprano Leanne Keneally is attending the Cologne Opera Studio as a young artist for 12 months after winning the 1999 German Operatic Award of the Operation Opera Foundation Australia. Soprano Sarah Crane has renewed her contract with the Cologne Opera as a young artist. Mezzo-soprano Louise Callanan continued her contract as a young artist with the Paris National Opera and baritone Les Flanagan was awarded a two-year contract as a young artist with the English National Opera in London. Conservatorium students continue to perform at many of the world's great opera houses and orchestras and continue to fill positions with the Queensland Symphony Orchestra, Queensland Philharmonic Orchestra and Opera Queensland. Many have been accepted into the Australian National Academy of Music. In one of my roles as President and Chairman of the Queensland Youth Orchestra Council, I see many of the conservatorium students as members of the Queensland Youth Symphony and as members of other orchestras and ensembles. Many have, of course, gone on to be members of the Australian Youth Orchestra and many famous overseas orchestras. Several of the students will tour South Korea and Europe with the Queensland Youth Symphony later this year, and that program will include representing Australia at the World Expo in Hanover, Germany, on Australia's day at the Expo, that being the day when the Prime Minister and most of the state premiers will be at Hanover. Conservatorium student Lance Coburn won the inaugural Lev Laslenko International Piano Competition and he will tour Europe with the Queensland Youth Symphony. Five conservatorium students or graduates were among the 20 finalists, many of whom were from overseas. You, our graduates, today join an impressive company of people who have gone before you and who have already achieved success and acclaim both in this country and overseas. As our new graduates, you will, I am sure, make an equal contribution. As we continue with this evening's proceedings, I express warm congratulations to each of you and extend to you 
our best wishes for your lives ahead. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there will now be a brief musical interlude, performed by Gina Driscoll, cello, with Penelope Buescher, piano. They will perform the vocalese in E minor by Rachmaninoff.
I now call on the Provost and Director of the Queensland Conservatorium to present graduates who are to receive their awards at this ceremony. Deputy Chancellor, I present graduates from the Queensland Conservatorium who have been granted the following awards. Bachelor of Arts Music, Suzanne Orr. <clears throat> Bachelor of Arts Music with Second Class Honours, Division A, Angela Fullwood. Bachelor of Music, Salisa Bartlett. <clears throat> Samuel Bates. <clears throat> Simon Bell. Andrew Bull, Matthew Cadman, Mong Lu Chu. David Coit. <clears throat> Katina Konomos. <clears throat> Sophie Cook. Timothy DeVos. Amra Devisovich. Nicole Faham. Nathaniel Ford. <clears throat> Matthew Hadgraft. <clears throat> Rachel Harbison. Gary Honor. <clears throat> Vivian Shao. <clears throat> Shi Chung Su. Danielle Hughes. Andrew Kennedy. Deanne Lee. Katarina Manolatis. <clears throat> Ka 
Christine Murchie. <clears throat> Katie Noonan. <clears throat> Marcus Ojala. Jacqueline Paul. <laughs> Rebecca Rich. <laughs> Tim Robinson. Andrew Stafford. Gregory Stanton. Grace Chai. Ming Si Chai <clears throat> Ashley Van Galen <clears throat> Elizabeth Wagner Michael Wainwright. <clears throat> Sally Ann Webster. <clears throat> Celeste Yang. Sharon Yang. <clears throat> Bachelor of Music Composition, Philippa Egan. <clears throat> Bachelor of Music Instrumental, Leona Collier. Dana Moran. <clears throat> Melinda Munchow. <clears throat> Bachelor of Music, Music Technology, Caleb Dunstan. Rachel Edwards. Mark Hennessy. Matt Newlands. Andrew Nielsen. Ben Van Klinken. <clears throat> Bachelor of Music Vocal, Owen O'Neill. <clears throat> Bachelor of Music and Composition, Camille Newman.
Bachelor of Music with First Class Honours in Composition, Matthew Tonks. Bachelor of Music in Contemporary Music, David Exton. <laughs> Philip Noy. <laughs> Bachelor of Music Education, Anita Dyer. Luke Harrison. Nancy Watkinson. Jeffrey Watson. Bachelor of Music Performance with First Class Honours. Teresa Bricks. <laughs> Bachelor of Music with First Class Honours in Musicology, Bridie Lee Bartlett. <laughs> Rebecca Palmer. Bachelor of Music in Pedagogy, Shelley McMahon. <laughs> Catherine Steindl. <laughs> Bachelor of Music in Performance, Zoe Brecht. David Church. Danielle Collins. Adam Korn. Rachel Davies. Nicola Elwell. <laughs> Melissa Ems. <laughs> Alison Evans. <laughs> Rebecca Helbig. Paul Johnston. <laughs> Dimitri Kopanakis. <laughs> Shinwei Lin. <laughs> Layla Mayevsky. Shannon McCullough. <laughs> Catherine Murray. <laughs> Jennifer Newlands. <laughs> Camille Olin. Deborah Reed.
Jenny Ward. <laughs> Bachelor of Music with First Class Honours in Performance, Jung Yun Bian. Deputy Chancellor, the next graduate has been awarded the Conservatorium Medal for 1999 for the highest academic achievement in a bachelor's degree course or in one of a prescribed set of bachelor's degree courses. Gina Driscoll. Christy Hinch. <laughs> Mazumi Yamamoto. <laughs> Bachelor of Music with Second Class Honours, Division A in Performance. Penelope Buescher. <laughs> Heather Ferguson. <laughs> Shane Palmada. Shannon Tobin. <laughs> Jeremy Watt. <laughs> Vicky Yang. Bachelor of Music with Second Class Honours, Division B in Performance. Katrina Mill. <laughs> Graduate Certificate in Vocal Pedagogy, Robin Edgar. <laughs> Lynn Gillette. Graduate Diploma of Music, Instrumental Performance, Mary Callanan. <laughs> Graduate Diploma of Music, Opera Performance, Jennifer Dunn. <laughs> Ruth Henning Lincoln. Kate Spence. <laughs> Graduate Diploma of Music Studies, Claire Reed. <laughs> Darren Sardi. Graduate Diploma of Music Technology, Bruce College. Robin Fussbender. Master of Music Performance, Helen Therese Good.
Rosemary Howes. <clears throat> Master of Music Studies, Adrian Foss. <clears throat> Gemma Glynn. Grant Houston. <clears throat> Angela Murphy. <clears throat> Pak Hon Ng. <clears throat> Yian Pan. Ladies and gentlemen, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Bill Lovegrove, will now present candidates for the award of the University Medal. This will be followed by the presentation of candidates for the award of Doctor of Philosophy. Deputy Chancellor, I now present candidates for the award of the University Medal. The University Medal may be awarded to a graduate who has completed the requirements for both a bachelor's degree of the university and a degree with first class honours in recognition of academic excellence. Deputy Chancellor, I am pleased to present graduates who have been granted the 1999 University Medal, Queensland Conservatorium, Gina Claire Driscoll. Matthew John Tonks. <laughs> Masumi Yamamoto. Deputy Chancellor, I will now present candidates for the award of Doctor of Philosophy. Tonight, the University is proud to honour graduates who have satisfied the rigorous criteria for the award of the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Deputy Chancellor, the following graduates have been granted the degree of Doctor of Philosophy taken at the Queensland Conservatorium. Dr Varney. Dr. Varney's thesis provides a description and analysis of the Bambuco dance, a, song, a dance, song, and musical form associated with the Colombian Andean region. Dr. Weston. Dr. Weston investigated music and musical thought associated with the New Age movement and concluded that current ideology constitutes the culmination of a trend in musical thinking that stretches back for at least a century. Deputy Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Queensland Conservatorium.
Ladies and gentlemen, there will now be a brief musical interlude. Masumi Yamamoto, piano, will perform the Abeg Variations by Schumann.
gives me pleasure to call upon the Vice-Chancellor of Griffith University, Professor Roy Webb, to introduce the guest speaker. Mr Deputy Chancellor, our guest speaker, Mrs Anna Conway, is the Executive Director, Centenary of Federation Queensland, the body set up by the Queensland Government to direct and manage the state's involvement in the celebrations for the Centenary of Federation in 2001. Susanna Conway came to Australia in 1979 and worked initially with the Melbourne Theatre Company, first as a company stage manager and then as an assistant director and tributary director organising school performances and readings of new plays. Prior to taking up her current appointment in February 1998, Ms Conway was General Manager of Opera Queensland, a position she had held since 1991. During this time, Opera Queensland nearly doubled its annual turnover and has become the second largest opera company in Australia. Ms Conway was educated in England at Greycoat Hospital, Westminster, the Central School of Speech and Drama, and University College London. She's a fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, a fellow of the Australian Institute of Management, and a member of the Women Chiefs of Enterprises International. In 1998, she was awarded the Woman of Achievement Award by Brisbane Zonta Club. Chancellor, it gives me very great pleasure to call upon Susanna Conway to deliver this evening's occasional address. Deputy Chancellor Mr Norman Fussell, Vice Chancellor Professor Roy Webb, Professor Simone de Haan, members of the Griffith University Council, distinguished guests, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honour to be with you here this evening at the Queensland Conservatorium of Music, one of the finest music academies in Australia. Indeed, tonight reminds me very much of my own graduation from London University many years ago, certainly more years than I care to remember. It was an exciting night with family and friends honouring one's achievements and with a feeling of exhilaration that we were finally being let loose on an unsuspecting world with all that that had to offer. You graduates here tonight will probably have heard from your peers and from teachers how hard life is out there in the real world, the difficulties of establishing a career the discipline required to follow your chosen path in the world of music. Yes, they're probably right. It is tough out there. Perhaps only 10% of you will achieve your goals and become stars in the opera firmament or on the concert stage. But just for tonight, at least, please allow yourself the luxury to believe in the brightest of futures. Have pride in your achievements. And as far as we're all concerned, tonight you're stars. For tonight, rather than talk to you about how difficult it all is out there in the world, I'd like to talk about success, your success and your future. And in order to give you perhaps a bit of an insight into what success means and how to achieve it, I perhaps will give you a few um, details of my own background and early career and the influences that have put me where I am today and what I believe are the skills and attributes that you need to give you some advantage in life and to achieve that uh, elusive word success. In many ways my schooling, training and qualifications are typical of many of you today and certainly of most middle class children in Australia who've probably had a private school education. The difference for me was that I came from a relatively poor Catholic working class North London background went to a very rough local primary school which was uh, put on the hit list to be closed down. But uh, fortunately I was quite bright at school, did well in exams and that qualified me to win a scholarship to one of London's best grammar schools which happened to be around the corner from Westminster Abbey. Suddenly I mixed with the aristocracy and the wealthy which was quite a shock for an 11 year old. 
Uh, I was by far the poorest child in the class. I was the one with the second-hand school uniform and the very strong North London Cockney accent. If you've ever seen the TV series Minder, that was the accent that I had at 11. So uh, it was a pretty hard environment to go into because I was mixing with a lot of girls who had come from private school uh, and from uh, very, very rich backgrounds. So I had to fight very hard for acceptance and recognition in that environment. For me, money and family wasn't going to be the answer, so being clever in class seemed to be what I needed to do. So that's what I, um, I tried hard. My father, who was of Southern Irish Catholic extraction and was completely self-educated, wanted the best possible education for his three girls, and I was constantly encouraged to work hard and take advantage of every opportunity that was given to me. There's no doubt that high school changed my life, and I think has a lot to do with any personal success that I may have achieved in my career. Also, what I learned at school and later at university, together with my own personal values and ethics, have been the backbone of how I've approached both life and work. And to some extent or another, these values, these qualities that we have, also contribute uh, to what we achieve in life, and that elusive word, as I mentioned, success. In my case, they were often able to get me the right job at the right time. So what are these values or, or qualities? Well, firstly, for me, I have a very strong competitive edge. I'm a very driven person. I have to succeed in everything I do. I'm really strong-willed. I'm a bon born leader, I think. I'm very happy to make decisions, and I'm probably very ambitious. Secondly, and rather contrary to that, I have a great desire to please those people around me. At school, this was my parents, particularly my father, who was very demanding, and also my teachers. I used to work hard for them, make them proud of me, and to prove that to them in many ways, naively, I expect, that hard work and application, not money or power, were ultimately the key to success. To my shame, and this is hard to admit to after 20 years in business, I still do this today. I have an overwhelming need to prove to whoever it might be that I'm the best at what I do, will deliver what I promise, and won't let them down. I've based a lot of my career and credibility on this reputation, and I have to tell you, it works. I expect it, it's something that we all want our politicians to be, but we don't often get that. This desire to please also stems from the fact that I was once fired by a theatre company in England. Not my fault, as it turned out, but it was an experience that always drives me to do my best at all time. That, that fear of being, um, of being summoned in and told that you're no longer wanted is a, is a very scary thing. I also think at the risk of being chauvinistic, it's a very strong female trait in the workplace, and one which I think uh, women can use to their best advantage. So there's a, a thing just for the girls here tonight. Uh, thirdly, uh, what I think I have that has helped me succeed is a degree of toughness, certainly independence, an ability to look after myself, combined with a very strong obstinate streak and a tenacity to hang in there and not give up, even when the going gets hard. I also have a very strong work ethic that was instilled in me by my uh, uh, parents, and I believe very strongly in discipline and hard work. I don't think you get anywhere without working hard for it, and this is particularly true if you're on the poor end of the British class system, which most of you aren't suspect to. Fifthly, I have a real um, difficulty in dealing with stupidity and with people who won't or don't want to pull their, work, uh, their weight in the workplace. Uh, uh, I have a very low, in, low level of intolerance, in other words. This gets a bit worse as I get older, and I meet people who've often given up on the system. So I really have no time for incompetence or slack, slackness or for people without some sort of passion and conviction for their work. Maybe this is also why I love working with artistic and creative people because they're usually so totally dedicated to their art. Um, and six, I suppose I have a belief that women can do as well in the workplace as men. This probably doesn't affect you so much today, but 20 years ago, this was a novel idea. I was schooled during uh, Germaine Greer's rise to power in the 60s and 70s, and I'm very much a product of that affirmative action and the revelations of the female eunuch. Subsequently, I guess it never really occurred to me that once I got out there in the workplace, men could have any bias at all towards employing women in key roles. And with a few exceptions, I have to say I've really encountered any personal prejudice based on gender, simply, I suppose, because I really refuse to believe that it exists. 
Um, you probably don't have to worry about that in quite the same way nowadays, but uh, it still can be an issue. From school, I went to university, studied arts, got a first-class honours degree in London, went to drama school and studied acting. I was determined on some sort of career in the theatre and it didn't really matter what it was. I subsequently toured England and Europe in many different productions, took on every possible role in the theatre to learn about it. I worked front of house as a programme seller, as a bar attendant, backstage as a dresser, a stage manager, a technician, a lighting and a sound operator. I learnt to build sets, I directed shows, I designed shows, I wrote programmes and I learnt about marketing and public relations. Um, in Yorkshire, I ran a theatre and education company, and I even eventually did some acting, which is why I went into it all in the first place. Uh, I took every job that I was offered, and I absorbed all that I could of this really fascinating business, so that by the time I entered the more senior echelons of theatre and opera in administrative roles, my knowledge and my list of contacts was wide-reaching, and I think this has kept me in very good stead throughout my working life. It's worth noting that I've never had, and really never had, and certainly didn't have in my early 20s, anything like a game plan or a defined career path of any, any sort. I never said to myself, at 25 I'll be at point Y, at 30 I'll have achieved X, and at 40 I'll have the Porsche and the, and the swimming pool. I accepted jobs as they came along out of fun, out of a need to earn a living, a desire to see parts of the country or to travel around Europe, uh, a willingness to work with certain directors, with certain actors, with friends, a hunger to learn more. Because, as you will all know, working in the theatre, as in the music world, is not just a living, it's a way of life. And work, for me, has always been a major part of my whole life, not something separate. So every job that I've ever done has logically grown in some form or other from the previous one. And I've really, to some extent, gone with the flow and taken the opportunities as they've arisen, often without too much planning in advance. So you might ask, how does one manage all this so well, particularly if you haven't planned anything? To have jobs that many of my friends and colleagues envy, to have done things like juggle a fairly demanding career that's involved lots of travel with looking, uh, with looking after a husband, who also looks after me most of the time, with two children, and to be seen as relati relatively successful, particularly then when there wasn't any sort of master game plan. So is it just luck, or was I in the right place at the right time, or is it something else? It's been said that if you don't know where you want to go, you'll probably end up somewhere else. In a world where career decisions are expected to be made early, it's easy to climb a ladder and never find the time to pause and ask if it's the right one. The consequence is predictable. At some point, all too many of us wake up one day and finally acknowledge that something we may have suspected for a long while is true. The ladder we've been climbing is propped up against the wrong wall. When that happens, the journey to a more satisfying career can appear dismayingly difficult. Many never make the journey at all. Not knowing how to do so, they choose instead, instead to pursue the apparently safe path of staying with the known. But that apparent safety is an illusion. In today's world, the saying, there is no security, only opportunity, is literally true. Those who choose to defend the status quo by following a path where there is no heart are often displaced from their positions by others who are following the same path, but with a total commitment. And because there's little satisfaction for most of us in pursuing a career solely for its material benefits, and because our careers are such a major part of our lives, the defensive approach to one's career is an almost certain recipe for diminishing self-esteem and an unsatisfying life in general. Ultimately, I believe, it can rob us even of our health and of precious relationships. Health is in inseparable from happiness and self-esteem, and the respect that underlies a strong relationship can wither where one party is pursuing a timid and defensive path in life. So the issue is just not one of security or of interesting work. Most of us recognize that we live in one of the most privileged societies in human history, and we naturally want to believe that through our lives and through our work, we're making a difference, not just a living. We want to contribute something to creating a better way of life for others. It's not unrealistic, I think, particularly here in Australia, to expect to accomplish this or anything else for which our basic abilities fit us. 
The underlying issues in developing our careers to be the way that we want them to be are really the same as developing a business. In fact, in today's economy, I think it's essential for each of you who are serious about success to think of yourself as a small business. Businesses are built on three things, dreams, planning, and action. Every great business begins with the vision of something that could be brought about if the right things were done. That dream or vision must be linked with planning to have any prospect of becoming a reality, and eventually those plans must be put into action. I think it was the American philosopher Carl Sandburg who said, nothing happens unless first a dream. Yet most of us begin our careers, and I guess I'm still continuing mine, without a clear and motivating vision of what we could accomplish, and we never really develop one. For many of us, the reality is that our careers have been built without a dream and with very limited planning. Our success has resulted largely from one thing, a capacity for action. And how much more might we be capable of accomplishing if we were animated by dreams and plans as well? Whilst I've never had a specific game plan that masterminded my career, I've always had dreams, a vision, and some plans for the future, albeit, I think, on a rather modest and perhaps realistic level. I've run my own business, and I've also run a successful arts company. They were both things that I wanted to do very much at the time. I've always tried to take the jobs I've wanted to do and felt a commitment to. I think I've always worked hard. I've shown enthusiasm. I've tried to be part of a team as well as a team leader, and I've been highly disciplined. And these skills ultimately, I believe, are recognized and appreciated by, by employers. For all of us, our skills and our attributes are a mixture of our qualifications and what school, home, and training has taught us many years ago. However, and perhaps more importantly, it's also how we use that knowledge that we've attained and the contacts that we've made through our working lives to help us succeed in this current economic and changing world. So, what do I recommend to all of you who stand here on the threshold of both your adult lives and your careers? Firstly, I guess, make the most of your qualifications. They help you to rise up the ladder quicker, unless, of course, you're overqualified. We have to be really aware of uh, the cleaner who has the PhD. Secondly, and this is a bit contrary to that, where necessary, undertake further study if it helps you achieve the right goal. Thirdly, I, I believe in today's world, regardless of what you want to do, it's important to hone your information technology skills. They're constantly needed, no matter what you decide to do. And fourth, take any training opportunities that present themselves if you're in a working situation. They're usually free and they usually help. As far as networking is concerned, particularly in the world of the arts, you can't underestimate the power of the people that you know. The widest network of contacts is crucial, so make a list of everyone and ask them shamelessly about opportunities. Remember that most jobs, particularly in the arts and music world, are not advertised. At least 71% of all work is the hidden marking, market. It's done through, through people that you know and networking. I believe that jobs often look for you, not the other way around. You need, of course, to know the right people, and you need to be astute politically, and you need to acquire good references. You also need to go to lots of functions, accept engagements, because that's where the opportunities are, particularly in the music world. One thing you really have to do is sell yourself. You need to have a positive attitude towards your career and when you want, want, where you want to go next. You need a level of confidence in your abilities and a strong sense of self-esteem. If you're not sure of yourself, no one else will be. Selling has been called the transference of human emotion. So if you give out positive feelings, uh, those will come back to you and people will see a person that really can do the job. So in the world of selling, the first sale is yourself. You need that edge on the market. If you want success in the current world, you also need to be prepared to move regularly, uh, particularly in your area of activity. Obviously, living in Brisbane will not be where you will succeed in the world market. Doesn't mean that you can't stay here and do some good things, but I still think you will need to look at other opportunities. You'll only rise on the career ladder if you're flexible and if you take those opportunities. So always keep your CV constantly updated. You never know when you're going to need it, and you need to keep in touch with all those contacts. 
Also think you shouldn't be too set in your ways with regard to a career path. This can lead to disappointment and, and unhappiness. Have an overall plan, sure, but don't be too specific. Be prepared for avenues that you may never have thought of. Negotiate for yourself. Never sell yourself short in terms of salary or conditions, etc. Know what you want and stick to it. Know your own worth, and I believe that most employers will appreciate this. Finally, and in conclusion, I have no better advice to offer you than to believe in yourself and your abilities to take the opportunities as they arise. Don't be afraid of taking risks. You may fail from time to time. I expect we all fail uh, when we take a risk, but the chance of success will be that much greater. After all, even being born is a risk. Coming into this life is a challenge, and the best things that happen to us are those that happen unexpectedly and will move you on to the next role and the next opportunity in life. I'd like to say to all of you graduates here tonight, good luck to each and every one of you. I wish you a brilliant and successful career. Thank you. Deputy Chancellor, it falls to my lot to thank our speaker for this extraordinary address. I'm not sure that I can add much, folks. I wish I'd had it when I was your age. Uh, well, a, an extraordinary address. Uh, this, this lady uh, describes herself as driven, uh, always seeking the competitive edge, and a born leader. This is the person that I ignorant of all this, of course, set out to negotiate with the terms of agreement between Opera Queensland and the university in relation to these shared facilities. Now, had I known, I would certainly have, have sought some uh, strong support in those uh, negotiations. Well, I hope you've all taken this down because you could pay a lot of money for that kind of advice you've had tonight. Uh, from expensive consultants who will advise you about career development, um, and you had it all for free. A wonderful story, and uh, I'm sure it's going to lead to a total change in your lifestyle immediately after this graduation as you all <laughs> rush out trying to implement this advice. The only comment I've got is that you, you're all going to do so well at it now that the future is going to be interesting for us all. But it is a truly remarkable address. We do thank Susanna Conway for being with us tonight, for sharing so clearly and so frankly and so effectively uh, her career with us and her advice about yours. Would you join with me in thanking Susanna Conway once more? Ladies and gentlemen, the ceremony is now completed. When the music begins, please rise and remain standing as the dais and staff procession and graduates retire. Good evening. <laughs>